So we have a series of remarkable bits of evidence. The redshift, the brightness of the supernova, allowing us to see that the more distant something is, the faster it appears to be flying away. The microwave background radiation, the afterglow of a big explosion, and the ratios of the elements, hydrogen, helium, and lithium in the early universe, that all tell us this remarkable story that the universe began in a hot, dense state 13.7 billion years ago. In the last couple of minutes, though, I want to go all the way back to the very beginning, or at least a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. Because I think one of the most remarkable things in physics is that we can even talk about not only three minutes after the universe began, but actually a billionth of a second after the universe began. How on earth can we talk about the processes that happened back then? Well, we can, because we've got this machine, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva. This is the place where I work, 27 kilometers in circumference. We accelerate hydrogen atoms, hydrogen nuclei, protons, around this ring until they're going at 99.999999% of the speed of light. That means that they go around this ring 11,000 times every second. And then we collide them together to make mini explosions. And the temperatures in those explosions are, we think, about the same as the temperature a billionth of a second after the universe began. And we can keep doing this, bang, 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 recreating mini Big Bangs, if you like, to look at the physics, the processes that were happening all the way back at the earliest moments of time. We collide them together. This is a picture of the LHC, a big machine. The proton beams go around in these two pipes here. We collide them together inside giant detectors. This is the detector I work on, which was partially built here in Manchester, called the Atlas Detector. A huge digital camera, 7,000 tons, 44 meters wide, 22 meters in diameter. Here are some little people stood underneath it so you can get a sense of the scale. Here's a picture when it was being built. Just again, you get a sense of the, the size and ambition of this project. And there's a little man, a real man, stood in the middle of this experiment. And this is a picture of one of those collisions that happened, um, well, actually, on the, th on the 30th of March of this year. So we're now at LHC, colliding particles together, recreating those earliest conditions. What have we found? Well, we found that the universe is made of uh, 12 particles of matter held together by four forces of nature. We've also found that there's something missing in our picture of the universe. So something happened in those first billions of a second after the Big Bang. And that something is that things got mass. So literally, if you look at your hand now, it's a solid thing. It's got mass. You've got mass. The particles in your body have got mass everywhere you look. That's the place where our understanding of the universe stops at the moment. And that's the place that the LHC is beginning to explore. And I'll show you one more piece of absolutely crazy maths. There it is. That is the summary of our understanding of the universe as it is today, but with a guess for how particles in the very early universe got mass, which is this bit. And the LHC is checking this bit. So by the time, actually, you, if you decide to do physics through to A-level and come to university, by the time you get to university, it may well be that we know whether that bit is right or whether that bit is wrong. And you should be learning about what happened in the first billionth of a second after the Big Bang and how things acquired mass in the universe. So I think that's a remarkable story. I think what I hope I've done is gone back from today, uh, the formation of the moon, the fact that the Earth has an atmosphere, and then sweep back in time to show you some evidence for the fact that we believe that we found out that the universe began 13.7 billion years ago in an immensely hot, immensely dense state. But that's, I think, a demonstration of the power of physics and the power of science, but the power of one particular way of thinking. And just for the last minute or so, I'd like to tell you what I think this is. There's a very famous physicist, Richard Feynman, who um, got a Nobel Prize for understanding the way the electricity and magnetism works at a very fundamental level back in the 1950s and 1960s. And he used to say that the key to science is very simple, right? very simple indeed. What you do is you make a guess as to the way the universe works. So all the way back, thinking about the way the moon was formed. We looked at the moon, we thought it was a bit odd, and we guessed something. We guessed that another planet hit it. You then take that guess and you see what the consequences are. 
So you say, what if a planet hit the moon? What would happen? Well, everything would be spinning pretty fast. If it glanced, uh, it was a glancing blow, there wouldn't be much iron in the core. And you form, well, you work out what your guess implies about nature. Then you go and observe nature. You do an experiment. And you see whether the outcome of that experiment coincides with your guess and the consequences of your guess. And then, he said, this is the key to science. If what you find disagrees with experiments, then you are wrong. Right? It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your name is. It doesn't matter how important you are, how many titles you've got. If what you say disagrees with experiments, it is wrong. And in that statement is the key to science. And I think that's probably, if you take one thing away from my talk, I think that's what it should be. Because having opinions about the way the universe began seems quite bold, right? So I think the universe began 13.7 billion years ago. But we've computed what happens if you think that, and we've found that it agrees with experiment. That doesn't mean it's right, but it certainly means that that picture is not wrong. And I think that's vitally important because it's allowed us to form this remarkable picture of the universe. The Royal Society, who I work for, and Dame Nancy um, is, a, is, a, is a member of, the, the oldest continuous scientific institution in the world. It's been celebrating its 350th anniversary this year. It has a motto, which is essentially, on the word of no one, right? So no matter what anyone says, you can test what they say against nature. That is the process of thought which has taken us from the mudflats of Tanzania to the moon. It took us from the Wright brothers to the moon in 70 years. And I think if just a fraction of you decide you want to carry on in that spirit, uh, don't believe anything that you're told, essentially, unless you can check that it agrees with the evidence, then I think that we will progress much further than the moon in the future. Thank you very much.